What if we could make old waste into stylish new products? We've made it happen, but we could do so much more. Just imagine. What if enlightened designers made products to recycle for zero waste? What if consumers followed their heart, proud to make a difference? There is a way. Be part of it. We are the second largest carpet yarn producer in the world, the first largest in Europe. And in terms of nylon fiber production, we rank 10th or 11th in the world. Well, uh, we started uh, this project uh, many years ago, thanks uh, to the, how can you say, uh, solicitation by our customers, because of course we are an ingredient uh, producer, and without customers, nothing is really helping, happening. So I like the idea to put customer at uh, the center, you know, because without uh, customers, really, for us would not uh, have been possible. And uh, we had the crazy idea to try to regenerate uh, our fiber. Luckily, when we started the business, my parents, my father and my mother started the business 50 years ago, they chose nylon 6 or polyamide 6. And polyamide 6, uh, by coincidence, not by my choice, you know, so I'm taking uh, the merit, but actually this was uh, a coincidence uh, that uh, uh, started 50 years ago, has uh, a very good peculiarity, can be depolymerized. What does this mean? That normally when you recycle a plastic, you remelt it, which is good. Absolutely uh, something that you have to do because of course, rather than uh, wasting, uh, of course, uh, remelting and producing a new plastic out of a used uh, one uh, is a good uh, point. But of course, when you remelt it, uh, you have some limits. First of all, uh, the performances, sometimes uh, little, sometimes more uh, are uh, less good than the one originating uh, the waste. Secondly, how can you make, for example, uh, a white product uh, out of a black uh, uh, plastic, which is recycled, and so on and so forth. You know? So what we do is not to remelt, but we go back to the original building blocks of the polymer. So we go back to the monomer with a process which is quite simple, which actually we didn't invent it, but when nylon 6 was invented, they also invented the process uh, to break this uh, molecule into the original uh, monomer uh, that originated uh, the polymer. We simply, how can I say, uh, built it in a way to be more efficient, uh, much more uh, modern, and uh, at this point, once we have uh, the, the monomer again, we can produce a polymer which is like the virgin one. So when you have a polymer which is like the virgin one, you can reproduce whatever nylon 6 product you like. Then this was the first idea. Second point is uh, that we didn't want to use uh, uh, fiber waste, which we produce out of our process. This was too easy. Because uh, today, this fiber waste is already successfully uh, reused in the engineering uh, polymer business. So it has an outlet which is quite good, quite efficient. You produce a product which is very well demanded. And so we didn't understand why to use more energy to do something that was already, how can I say, uh, something good for, uh, for our uh, life and for our uh, business. So we wanted to use waste, post-industrial or post-consumer, that were not previously used because they had no value. So they were simply landfilled or at best incinerated. So we had to look for the waste. And in terms of uh, uh, pre-consumer waste, we found a lot of material coming from the chemical stage of the production, which previously were thrown away, as I said, or uh, uh, at best uh, uh, burn to make uh, energy and we can produce uh, raw material out of it. We are, produce, we are using plastic waste uh, from, uh, now I'm using a difficult word, cast polymerization of nylon 6, which is something that uh, today is not used in plastics. So again, another waste with very low value. And above all, uh, we are trying, and this is our target, to use post-consumer waste mainly coming from our uh, uh, customers because of course uh, we produce fiber but we sell fiber to an industry so we want to make our industry circular not uh, uh, aquafil because i mean at the end i survive if my customers survive and uh, i am successful if my customers are making money you know if i make money and my customers don't make money mm, 
we have a small uh, problem because sooner or later we go bankrupt uh, as well because of lack of uh, customers. So we have started uh, to build uh, and to invent technologies to recycle carpets, like uh, the one uh, produced uh, by Interface, and we are on, on the way to improve this technology um, on a daily basis. But also we found another uh, waste to be recycled, which are fishnet. And fishnet is a beautiful product because there is a relatively a high contempt of nylon six inside, 50-60% of a fishnet which we bring back after usage is nylon six, if of course the fishnet is produced out of nylon six because you can produce fishnet out of other polymers. What is the rest? The rest is water, because of course when they take uh, fishnet out of water, uh, humidity and water uh, remains. There is a very bad coating, because uh, as you could see from the video, the biggest part of the fishnet we recycle are coming from fish farming, not only from no normal fishing activities. This simply because today 80 plus percent uh, of the fish we eat is coming from uh, fish farming. So I mean, this is the biggest uh, uh, place where they're using uh, uh, fishnet. So farmers, in order to prolong maintenance cycle of fishnet, they apply a coating on, on these uh, nets, which is copper-based, which is uh, considered by our uh, European community an hazardous substance. So if you have more than 25% of weight of this copper-based uh, coating on the fishnet at the end of its life, you can't transport the fishnet from the farming to our recycling plant, which is placed in Slovenia, which is a beautiful country from the environmental standpoint, with a population which is highly uh, sustainable uh, oriented. Oh my God, I said, we can eat it, we cannot transport it. Because of course, microparticles of this coating are, how can you say, every, every minute uh, getting away from the net and eaten by the fish. Uh, was interesting. Uh, the point that was, ra was raised uh, this morning that we have to do something in order to prevent that, that all this uh, uh, garbage goes into the ocean, you know, because uh, whatever is in the ocean is eaten uh, by the animals living in the ocean, apart polluting and destroying uh, everything, and then we eat uh, this kind of uh, uh, thing. So, uh, magically, for our uh, European Communion, we can uh, grow fishes in cages with uh, a material uh, which is uh, hazardous, but uh, we cannot transport it at the end of its life. So, okay, nevertheless, we are now recycling. Uh, I think uh, the vast majority of the fishnets that are used in the farming in, uh, in our uh, um, European uh, uh, market, but not only, because we import uh, this kind of material uh, also from uh, Canada, from uh, um, South America, uh, from uh, Middle Eastern uh, areas, uh, from India, Pakistan, uh, Thailand, so from uh, all over the world. Very difficult to create the reverse logistics and to convince uh, bureaucratic uh, people uh, in Europe that we have to import waste in order to make uh, uh, a product. You can imagine, normally we export, we like to export uh, waste. We want to import uh, waste, so we are considered uh, very much crazy. And today we are also working to recycle this coating. Because of course, first, uh, initially we started to recycle the nylon. And now we are working and we have already some good uh, options to recycle the coating uh, of uh, the fishnet. Then, sorry, I cut the story short because if not, uh, I will take all uh, the time also to the other guests that are very important. Because as, as I said, if they don't make beautiful products, first of all, because the product must be beautiful. Because if they are recycled, uh, performing, uh, uh, sustainable, but not looking good, uh, nobody is going to buy them. <laughs> this is uh, another very important uh, point. So luckily they make beautiful products, uh, swimwear, carpet, and also other material containing uh, 906, uh, and then uh, you know, we are able to recycle this product uh, practically uh, an, an infinite uh, number of time. Uh, because uh, uh, if I am able to have a pure material in our depolymerization system, the yield of, dep of depolymerization is closer to one to one. So really, the loss is, is minimal. So, you know, we take uh, thousands of years before remaining without uh, material. That's it. This is very, very shortly what Aquafil is doing. Today, 
as I said, this uh, pretty large uh, company in the nylon fiber industry, starting in 2011, uh, we are producing more than, and selling more than 30% of our products uh, made in Econil. And the limitation, uh, there are two big limitations. Availability of waste, that we are building every day the logistics to bring back uh, the product, and of course the technology to recycle, and of course the cost, because at the end, uh, we have, we have also to be competitive, you know, because, uh, yes, uh, there are uh, consumers that are ready to pay more for a product, uh, sometimes uh, a little more, but this is uh, representing just the peak of the pyramid, you know, the, the, the biggest part of the consumers, unfortunately, they have not, in, how can I say, they are not very rich, they are not uh, having a big income, so they, w they would like uh, to use uh, a sustainable product, but if the product is more expensive, uh, at the end they have to purchase uh, the one which is less sustainable or non-sustainable, but uh, less expensive. So, thank you for, uh, for your attention. Miriam? We'll do Q&A after this, so uh, gather your, start thinking about your questions. Lovely, thank you. Uh, great to be here, and thanks, thanks, Julio. It's it's great to hear the Econil and the Aquafil story first. And I'm going to tell you a story that was really enabled by uh, Julio and Aquafil's leadership in this area. We sat in a room in 2011, I think it was, talking about how the circular economy could actually do more. Could, to your point, could the circular economy? Um, be inclusive as well? How can we bring a kind of additional social layer on top of what the, so the, the circular economy is doing? And that's personally, to me, a very interesting question. So this is something we've been exploring. Um, so this was, you know, this transition from nets, commercial fishing nets, to it was something that's been enabled by the work that, that Aquafil does. We asked the kind of seemingly ridiculous question, well, how could a carpet tile address inequality? How could a carpet tile tackle poverty? Um, and this connection has enabled us to start exploring that. So we've, we've developed a, a program called Networks, which empowers communities and replenishes the ocean by turning waste into opportunity. The waste being the, the very high quality nylon six fishing nets, the kind of monofilament fishing nets that are found in um, uh, remote artisanal fishing communities. And the opportunity being people generating additional income um, and uh, being empowered by the sense of see, you know, seeing what happens when they're cleaning up their own, own environment. Um, so it's been a very interesting collaboration, and um, as the previous speaker said, all these things come from the unusual suspects in the room, right, which is what plasticity is great at doing. So, you know, this is one of the villages that we've been working with in, in the Philippines. That's what people step out of their house to see. Um, lots of plastic waste in there, lots of nylon fishing net waste in there. No solid waste management um, in these areas. And of course, in these parts of the world where people are reliant on the, the health of the fish stock for their own livelihood, there's this kind of vicious circle of the more plastic waste that's getting into the environment, the less income they can generate from the fish stocks, which, which depletes. So we're trying to intervene at a point of you know, maximum effect by taking those out and therefore enabling some additional revenue, um, but longer term contributing to, to improving the, the marine habitat for, for these communities. So I'll just show some images of, of some of the work um, that we're doing with partners ZSL. Starts in the community. This is at, um, at Julio's site. Uh, we've worked very closely to make sure that, that the materials, the right density, the right cleanliness, really trying to pu push as much of the value add down to community level um, as physically possible. And I think your, your team have been pretty pleased with what we've able to produce, which is, which is great. The, I'll just, just touch on this, the community banks have been an interesting way for us to solve some, some logistical and supply chain challenges. You know, a big 
problem when we started this program, which, which we intended from the beginning not to be philanthropy, but essentially to be kind of community-based enterprise where these um, groups were competing and supplying on equal terms to you know, a, a developed world fish farm, for example. One of the big challenges to making that work was how do you aggregate and densify this kind of voluminous material that's spread over, you know, vast, um, you know, over vast geographies. We needed a point of sale, if you like, um, that would make the, the kind of in-country P&L work. So community banks have become a, an aggregation point for that transaction to, to take place and have also provided, you know, a very tangible benefit from conservation activity, essentially, for, for these communities. So that's been a very kind of interesting and unintended uh, benefit. We always talk about kind of the unintended consequences, but there are unintended benefits sometimes when you try something like this. So the, the, the kind of phase one of this program, 600 families, 55,000 people in the Philippines and Cameroon, a small amount of material so far, 100 tonnes, but this is super damaging monofilament stuff. It's nasty stuff if it gets into the environment, as Doug knows. This, this amount would go around the world two times. So, you know, weight-wise, um, not huge, but something that we're planning to grow to 2020 to reach, um, reach a million people. And in the process of expanding that supply chain, uh, better protect a billion square metres of ocean. And this is all part of the transition that's happening at Interface, going from looking at kind of less bad to more good, going from negative, um, negative to positive. So just one of the things that we're looking at. And if you'll allow me time-wise, I've just got a, a little two-minute video that, that, um, that we may or may not have available. And uh, I'd happy to take any questions afterwards. Thank you. Before, before we get into a big, lively discussion, Diana, would you yes. like to uh, give us your presentation? That was great. Um, hi, everyone. I'm, I'm Diana, as they've introduced me already. And I'd like to say thank you very much, Miriam, for showing that really amazing video. I'm half Filipino myself, so seeing something like that, I've seen like the, the waste firsthand, and it's really amazing um, to see that. And also, Julia, thank you so much for you know, kind of coming up with this amazing process and for me to be able to use this fabric within designing. Um, so yeah, my brand is called Araya, and it's a swimwear brand. Um, I kind of, uh, I study at London College of Fashion, um, and 
is a, a degree specialising in lingerie and swimwear, kind of random. But um, so I kind of got into swimwear because um, basically um, Speedo gave us a live brief one year um, at university, and they basically banned um, banned this uh, fabric called Le um, Laser Racer Fast uh, far Skin, and um, so this is a picture of like the um, leggings and the shorts that Michael Phelps basically he got. He won eight gold medals, and they thought that um, he won it because of this. And anyway, it got banned. And I, I had to recycle this into um, this. So this is one of my swimsuits that I made. Um, and so after this, for my graduate collection, I was like, I want to do a, I want to do a swimwear collection. Um, but I want to be able to like be inspired by this um, sustainable project. I want to be able to make it as sustainable as possible. Um, so. Um, I kind of like, you know, went around asking different fabric mills and is there a sustainable fabric out there? Everyone comes back, no, no, no. And I was like, oh, this is kind of going to be an impossible task. And last minute, I spoke to um, one of um, the partners that they work with, Carvico, which is with one of the fabric places. And um, they turned around like, we've actually, we're just bringing out a brand new um, fibre called Econil. It's launching to the market in about a couple of weeks' time. And I was like, perfect, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use this. Um, so yeah, that was kind of the beginning of my story and getting in touch with um, Econo. Um, so yeah, this is my graduate collection. Um, I'm just going to show you a little slideshow of like, my kind of designs, quite kind of, kind of fun, fat forward fashion kind of. Um, this is the graduate catwalk show, my studio where I make all my swimwear. Um, these are little more photo shoots. Um, and yeah, a, a word that comes up a lot is collaboration that I've heard and I think that's very important within the industry to kind of outreach um, your kind of like ideas and collaborate with other designers. So it's something that I've done in terms of um, like digital printing to bring um, this fabric and the kind of the sustainable element to like other people. So this is a collaboration I did with a, another London-based brand called Silver Spoon Attire. This is Rihanna. Um, wearing one of my bikinis. <laughs> um, and this is another collaboration with a, a, a new gen designer, which is part of London Fashion Week. This is um, on the catwalk show that we did at London Fashion Week last year. And another catwalk show. Um, so yes, like the whole kind of uh, sustainability aspect. Um, earlier this year, I was really um, privileged to be involved in a project that Selfridges was doing. It was called Bright New Things, and they kind of were, they wanted to put a spotlight on um, a few sustainable designers and obviously because of uh, the, the fabric that I use um, I was then chosen and I was very lucky to be able to have a window in the Selfridges, um, Selfridges on Oxford Street um, which was, um, went on for three months which is really great. Um, these are all the other bright new things who do some amazing other uh, projects with sustainability within their clothing. And um, yeah, the, and, and again with the, the whole collaboration thing. Um, so swimwear was is a one thing that I well, is my main thing that I do. But um, I get approached a lot from other people, um, kind of coming to me, be like, okay, well, what else can you do with um, with it, with you know waste materials? Um, so Sony came to me earlier this year, and and they they come up with um, they could bring out um, some headphones, wireless headphones. And they wanted me to um, recycle their waste fabric for the, from their like disc discontinued headphones. So they gave me a bunch of wires, and I was like, "Well, I'm a swimwear designer. Um, <laughs> I don't know what to do with this." They're like, "Well, we want you to do a kind of um, a travel capsule collection of like a beach bag and a you know beach sliders." Um, so this is what I came up with, and we've got some of the headphones. As you can see, you can see the headphone wires. Um, so I made some beach sliders, a sunglasses case, a passport holder, beach bag and a phone case. So all of these wires are um, waste material from Sony. Um, it's not for sale, unfortunately. <laughs> um, so yeah, and these are the pictures. Yeah, so that's it. And um, I've got a few examples of the swimsuits that I make. Um, I, I had a volunteer to 
to wear it, um, I think, over there somewhere. But I won't, I won't make you do it. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I can pass these around so you can like feel the fabric for yourselves. It's quite interesting to you know, see how um, the fabric comes from all this waste material that they kind of um, get. And um, I've done quite a, a fun a fishing net print on one of my swimsuits, a kind of tongue-in-cheek kind of um, way of um, showing the kind of process. So yeah, I can pass them around to you um, in a bit. Um, also, I've got a video to show you. It's definitely not as good as these guys. <laughs> but um, when, I went, uh, when I did the project with Selfridges, they, um, they um, got me to do a Snapchat takeover um, on their Selfridges Snapchat. And um, I was lucky enough to go out to Slovenia, where the factory is, and um, go and film it and see it for myself. Um, so yeah, this is the video, I think, should be coming up. Since this is the Olympics of plastic and sustainability, these, this is the gold medal team right here. Big hand. Because that really is a great example of, of you know, what we talked about earlier and how collaborations have to happen and how it goes into the community and, you know, really works at the local level in the developing world. So um, I know there's big questions um, and issues and log jams here. Um, you mentioned, Julio, the exportation of waste, uh, which a lot of people need as the feedstock to make the products that we're talking about doing to get the recycled content in. And scaling <coughs> from communities of uh, Cameroon and Philippines 
how are we going to get into 16 different countries now? And this is going to be a challenge that we all face as we try to source new ideas and materials. What, you know, what can we do? What should we think about when we're either lobbying or trying to find those partners um, and, and break those log jams? Well, uh, uh, lobbying, of course, is always uh, welcome when it is good, uh, uh, when it is done for something uh, good. Uh, I want also to raise another point, you know, because uh, the waste we are recycling today is produced uh, from products uh, engineered many years ago, very often. For example, a carpet, uh, before being uh, recycled, uh, may last uh, a minimum of five, uh, but sometimes 10 or 15 years which means that the carpets we are recycling today are 10, 15 years old. Why am I raising this question? Because uh, 10, 15 years ago, the regulation was not the one of today. And of course, uh, inside those products, uh, and I'm mentioning carpets, uh, to not, not to forget about uh, fishnets uh, with uh, the problem of coating, but in also in bottles or in every plastic which is inside, uh, you know, uh, years ago, uh, the regulation was much less strict than the one of today. So there are products inside that are uh, very potentially dangerous for, uh, for us. And this is, of course, uh, a problem. So it is not uh, wrong, the fact that uh, waste is to be controlled uh, during uh, its uh, entire life uh, uh, and, uh, of course, uh, also during its uh, transportation. Of course, uh, we must understand that uh, if we are doing something uh, which is helping uh, to, to improve the situation or even to resolve the problem, uh, we should uh, help, you know. So, uh, with our depolymerization system, uh, because it is not just remelting, uh, all these kind of hazardous waste uh, are not uh, returning back into the cycle because they remain on the bottom of the reactor and then uh, they go uh, into special uh, uh, incineration system uh, that are uh, very much controlled, mainly in the city of Vienna. So we choose uh, this uh, uh, system of incineration because uh, into our uh, uh, knowledge was the best one uh, available in, uh, in Europe and uh, at a close uh, distance, you know. So this is also helping uh, to remove those substances that were uh, allowed uh, 10, 15 years ago uh, and uh, to take them out of, uh, of the cycle. So lobbying is of course uh, uh, good, uh, providing that, of course, uh, the activity we are uh, doing uh, is, uh, how can I say, uh, bringing value and not uh, destroying uh, resources. Mm. Miriam, did you want to add anything? Um, no, I think that's a great summary, but it's something that we're, we've been struggling with for some time as well. It, you know, it's the pioneering companies who are saying we are going to bring material back who are then left with this technical challenge. So there's a, yeah, there's a, there's a work stream um, currently going on at Interface to look at how, how we can best filter the incoming materials and make sure we're addressing those challenges, yeah. Hmm. Great, any questions on the floor, yeah. John? Just back on that last example, the, the copper coating, did you actually overcome that problem or did you not use the, that material? This, this is a familiar problem, so the hazardous waste. The waves. copper coating? Yeah. Well, uh, we're now trying different things. First of all, uh, we are working uh, together with uh, uh, a producer of biocide uh, in order to invent a new product in order to substitute uh, the, this coating. And this, uh, we have uh, already a couple of farming uh, which are testing uh, nets uh, coated with this uh, material. Of course, uh, if we are able to do and to substitute uh, uh, copper coating with uh, other uh, systems that are uh, much less uh, dangerous and of course uh, uh, not harmful for, uh, for the human being and for the environment, uh, the problem uh, is uh, solved. Uh, then we are trying to reuse it, taking it back uh, to the maintenance uh, people that are coating uh, the nets. This is uh, an attempt that we are doing. Or we are trying to regenerate it. In this case, uh, we have a company in Slovenia that is taking uh, the coating and trying uh, you know, to regenerate it into some other uh, material. The best that we are trying to do is to produce uh, pure um, copper out of it. This is uh, something that is technically feasible, it is doable, we are now trying to resolve the economical part because of course if we are, if we are inventing a system to reproduce or to 
let's say, to decompose uh, this copper oxide into uh, pure uh, copper, but then uh, the cost of this uh, uh, process and uh, as a consequence, the impact, the environmental impact, because normally when uh, you are not cost competitive, uh, meaning that uh, you are costing more, uh, normally you are using more energy and uh, consequently you are also polluting uh, uh, more, you know. So, of course, uh, the ideal uh, solution would be to reproduce uh, 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 copper and then, uh, you know, to bring it uh, back for other application without uh, uh, mining uh, it. So these are the things that uh, we are uh, working on. Uh, we have not yet solved them, but uh, we are at, at a good uh, uh, point. Thanks. That's great. Hi, um, you, you mentioned carpet recycling. Are you talking about taking carpet and recycling it, or using product to make carpet? Um, but both. So, okay. yeah. So we so interface. Um, you know, we we try and design for disassembly at the start of the design process we then have a, a product take a life extension program and ultimately a product take back program and then we put we separate and put it back in that's really what i wanted to get at yeah the, the, the idea of carpet recycling is you roll that out to the public mm. the public think of carpet as carpet they won't be able to distinguish pa polyamide from pp yeah where do you tackle that problem at the point of collection or in process or do you just do very dedicated um, single brand take back schemes or do you see a, the potential for a wider rollout? Yeah, they're really great questions that we're, that I think the industry is uh, wrestling with, with the support of Julio. Yeah, the, I'm afraid no, no the answer is yet, it, but it depends, way. yeah. So we have a take back pro program that's probably most advanced um, in the US where we do take back um, Broadloom and other um, other products as well and we bring that back into our own that's a kind of closed loop back into our own manufacturing system um, and then the we have quality standards for for what will be acceptable from aquafil and that processing is done either on site or through partners to identify what what is the pa6 and what might be the 66 or the pt or other polymers if you want i can help you Unfortunately, nylon carpets are less and less used for residential application. Uh, today, the biggest uh, um, usage is in commercial applications, so like uh, the product that the interface is doing and selling, you know, for uh, hotels or uh, airports or uh, education for this kind of uh, um, final uh, demand. For residential, in Europe, the biggest uh, uh, Carpet uh, production is going uh, to polypropylene. In the US, it's going to polyester. This, of course, uh, is uh, uh, creating a problem because uh, these two products are not uh, recyclable in the same way that we are recycling. I don't want to say that they are not recyclable 100%. Uh, percent. The problem is that uh, you make a product with less value and also you have to know that uh, polypropylene and polyester uh, basic polymers are less expensive than nylon. What does it mean? That we have less room in terms of uh, cost to recycle. So this, this is making, uh, you know, you have two problems. You are, they are not depolymerizable in the same way as uh, nylon 6 uh, is. Second, being less expensive is more difficult to be uh, competitive. So at the end, uh, it's difficult to avoid the landfilling of this uh, product. But in Europe, uh, apart uh, uh, a couple of customers that have dedicated uh, programs to take back their um, tiles at the end of the life and then to try to recycle uh, them, nothing uh, is recycled in terms of uh, carpet. In the US, there are some uh, centers, mainly close to the main cities, where it makes sense, because of course, if you are in the middle of nowhere in a small village, I mean, uh, difficult uh, to, to be sustainable from the economical standpoint, uh, collecting a few uh, square yards of carpet uh, in of a small uh, home, you know. But if you are close to New York or uh, Los Angeles, uh, of course, uh, you have more uh, opportunities to collect large volumes uh, of uh, uh, post-consumer carpet. Then there are uh, people that are separating uh, the different uh, uh, fiber component. I mean, they are separating a polypropylene carpet from polyester, from polyamide 6 and 6.6. And then here, uh, 
what to do, you know. We can recycle the polyamide 6 uh, carpet, which unfortunately today in US they represent less than 25% of the market. So what do I, why, why am I saying this? That because in a few years from now, if you want to collect uh, one uh, kilo of, of uh, post-consumer uh, residential carpet in US, you have to collect uh, four kilos of other materials that are not uh, recyclable, you know, which is, of course, uh, a problem. Mm -hmm. So in this case, there are states like California that are helping and supporting the recycling industry, imposing uh, taxes on the product, and then they redistribute taxes to companies that are recycling uh, carpets or different uh, carpet uh, components, other states that are doing uh, nothing. But of course, it's a challenging uh, project. It's not something uh, uh, easy. Uh, everything here is, uh, is difficult, you know, to go in very far uh, islands and to spend years, because they took uh, years before uh, uh, teaching uh, local uh, people uh, how valuable was uh, this work, to collect, uh, you know, uh, some uh, material, not as a charity, but uh, as an opportunity. So it's, it's, it's a very challenging uh, project. But, uh, you know, uh, no challenge, no reward. <laughs> yeah, it's great. Um, Diana, quick question. What are the consumers, uh, your consumers and buyers, how do they like your products and knowing that? Do um, they know that it's coming from recycled fishing nets? Yeah, it's, it's, it's funny. I've been uh, in the industry for maybe four years now, and um, I got told when I went over to Slovenia that I was one of the first people to ever use Econo. Um, and definitely... In you know the last four years, there's been you know I don't know it's one of the most popular their popular sellers now with the fabric. So more and more I know Speedo or like um, big brands in New York called like Mara Hoffman. They're all using this Econo um, fiber within their swimwear. And yeah, I mean I kind of want to sell my stuff just as a you know it's a good it's a good design. People might want to wear it. Mm. Um, and it's kind of like an added little surprise when they find out once they've bought it, oh, it's, it comes from, you know, the Econo and it's made from, you know, regenerated nylon. And, and it's kind of like, I don't really go, go shouting out about it, but it's a nice little surprise when the consumer, you know, finds out about it. And yeah, everyone's really fascinated. And, and I think there's definitely, there's a rise in um, kind of awareness and people wanting to um, work with sustainable fabrics. Great. Well, on that note, um, I have a confession to make that the jacket and the suit that I'm wearing is made out of plastic bottles. <laughs> and so, uh, since we're talking fibers, um, it's good to see this industry, you know, and Julio, great work in, in really, you know, taking the leadership as a big company to, to make these moves and go for it, because that's what we need is these good case studies for others to follow. So thank you very much. We'll have lunch, and uh, that's downstairs again where we have coffee, and, and we'll try to speed it up a bit. Let's not do a full hour, so go down network, and we'll see you here in a bit. Thank you.